Good morning. Everybody hear me okay? So in 1994, the son of Kurdish dairy farmers left Turkey to come to the U.S. to study English. After a few years in the U.S., he decided to start a small feta cheese manufacturing company on the advice of his father back in Turkey. It was modestly successful. He hired a few employees. But it wasn't until 2005 that he took the biggest risk, and he bought a defunct yogurt factory in upstate New York. With no prior experience in the yogurt business, he created a yogurt empire that went from zero to a billion dollars in revenue in less than five years, becoming the number one manufacturer of yogurt in the US. In 2013, Ernst & Young named Hamdi Ulukaya Global Entrepreneur of the Year. And last week, tens of thousands of news outlets, from the nightly news, to print, to social media, to blogs, covered the story of how this Turkish immigrant had given away 10% of his company, Chobani, worth $5 billion to his upstate New York blue-collar employees. From Dublin to Delhi, from Boston to Berlin, millions of people were inspired and moved by images and videos of Hamdi embracing his employees. Employees who had entered a room for a meeting as an employee and left as owners of a company. Partners in the company that they'd helped build over the last 10 years. Who among us would not want this kind of coverage all over the globe? Who among us would not want this emotional connection with our companies? A look at the Facebook page the next day tells us just the outpouring of support and love that came from all over the world from people who hadn't even heard of Chobani who are now going to make it the only yogurt they ever bought. 80 years prior to that, in Germany, in the 1930s, buying a car was the luxury of the rich. But in 1933, Dr. Ferdinand Porsche decided he was going to change that, and he wanted to make cars available to everybody. And so in 1933, he started Volkswagen, the people's car. And the story of the people's car resonated for most of the 20th century, and Volkswagen grew and prospered. But then in 2015, we learned that Volkswagen had been rigging emissions tests for the past 10 years. We learned that 11 million vehicles had been affected, 500,000 in the US alone. Those owners who owned a Volkswagen saw the value of their cars drop overnight. Volkswagen had to set aside $18 billion to address the problems that they caused. And they reported an almost $6 billion loss in 2015. Two very different stories, but storytelling nonetheless. And what both companies have in common is that the results, the exposure that they got, the airtime that they got, how people were mobilized to react was something that neither company had ever experienced before and something that couldn't come from just the marketing department alone. So many of you are here today hoping to learn how to tell your story. Hopefully you want to be a Chobani and not a Volkswagen. That's in the other room. <laughs> but here's the thing. The rules of storytelling have changed. You no longer control the story. Your company doesn't control the story. It certainly doesn't come just from your marketing department. And in an age of online transparency, every action and every decision of a company can be seen immediately by people all over the world, when employees, when customers post to Facebook, to Glassdoor, to Twitter, to Tumblr, sharing details of the company. Today, the most important stories that are told about us are the ones told by our very stakeholders, not the ones we tell ourselves, because they're the most authentic. How many of us have seen the pictures of the Big Mac on the McDonald's adver advertisements, only to go into the restaurant and see something very different? Story told versus reality. So it's the stories that are told about us that are the most important. So your brand, your business, your startup is a story that's always being told. Whether you participate in the story or not, or whether you give permission, the story is being told. So what does that mean for us? What does that mean for those of us who want a great story told about us? We don't want a Volkswagen-style story told about us. We want to be the Chobanis. Well, I recently had a conversation with the CEO of a large company. He told me how he was getting more and more complaints for his products and services. And he was concerned that if people researched his company before buying, they discover the online reviews, they discover the complaints, and they take their business elsewhere. 
He wanted to change the narrative. But in order to change the narrative, we have to change that which we were narrating on. He wanted a better story, but his customers wanted a better company. Today, storytelling has moved from action to outcome. It's an outcome of every strategic decision we make in our company. When the news outlets covered the story of Chabani, this was not a... Um, this was not something that was designed around a marketing table or a war room. This was not a stunt to get free exposure. This was just the latest strategic decision made by a founder who had made similar decisions since the day he first bought the factory, like paying above average wages to his employees, like ensuring that all the ingredients for the products were natural, organic, ensuring that the dairy cows that he used for the, for the yogurt were GMO-free. The stories that were told about Chobani reflected authentically the culture and the actions of the company. When the EPA discovered that Volkswagen had been duping millions of people around the world for almost a decade, and the news outlets reported on it, this wasn't collusion among the media houses to bring down an automotive manufacturer. Instead, they were doing their jobs. They were reporting on the fact that strategic decisions had been made in a company to knowingly ship vehicles that did not meet the requirements, to knowingly tell lies, so the stories told about Volkswagen reflected authentically their culture and their actions. Howard Schultz, the famed CEO of Starbucks, who knows a thing or two about telling authentic stories and building a, an authentic empire, says that great companies and great stories don't emerge from marketing cubicles. They emanate from everything a company does. It's the execution of great strategies that inspire the stories that we want told about us. So if it's the strategies that create the stories, well, what are the strategies that we're supposed to pursue? What are the right strategies versus the wrong strategies? What are the Chobani strategies versus the Volkswagen strategies? But take this week alone. We've got 150 speakers, panelists, uh, on 75 different workshops and presentations. How do you decide which one to go to? How do you decide which one to attend? And when you do attend them, how do you decide which strategies, tips, nuggets of wisdom you're going to take away from these panelists to apply to your own business? We're faced with these questions every day in our business. Should I invest here? Should I invest there? Should I develop an app? Should I develop a mobile-friendly website? What should I do? How do we decide how to narrow down our, our options? The Chinese have a great proverb. They say that in the mind of the beginner, there are many opportunities and possibilities. But in the mind of the expert, there are few. So if we want few possibilities to narrow our focus, create the best strategies that ultimately tell the best stories, how do we do that? Well, when I was 10, I came across the books of Lewis Carroll for the first time, when I took part in the stage adaptation of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. I played the important role of Humpty Dumpty. I was a pretty young looking 10 year old. It was nerve wracking because I had to shake Alice's hand. And when you're 10 years old, shaking a girl's hand, that's kind of a big deal. But I carried the role off to critical acclaim and the show ran for two nights. It was no Hamilton, but people seemed to enjoy it. But the original story, the original book upon which the stage play is based, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, has a wonderful story. There's a wonderful exchange as Alice is walking through the woods and she comes upon the tree and she sees the Cheshire cat perched on the branch. And she asks the Cheshire cat, excuse me, sir, can you tell me which road I ought to take? Well, that depends a good deal on where you want to go, said the cat. Well, I don't much care where, said Alice. Then it doesn't matter which way you go, said the cat. So long as I get somewhere, Alice added as an explanation. Oh, you're sure to do that, said the cat, as long as you walk long enough. So both whimsical and profound, there's a great business lesson we can learn from this seemingly simple exchange. In business, we rush to tactics in the hopes of solving greater problems. We rush to storytelling in the hopes of hiding something else that's happening in the company. We make decisions based on trends and short-term decisions rather than strategy and long-term vision and purpose. We think we can incrementalize our way to success. When Simon Sinek delivered his famous TED Talk in 2009, 
he popularized the idea that not only was it important, but it was essential that we start with why with everything we do. Because if we don't know where we're going and we don't know why we're getting there, how will we know which road to take? How will we know which decision to make? What are the next five marketing campaigns I want to run? What logo should I have? What's the culture I want in my company? Who should I hire? Who should I fire? If we don't know the why or where we're going, these are questions that we'll never know the answer to. So if storytelling is inspired by our strategies, our strategies are determined by our purpose. For many of you, purpose may just be the latest album from humanity's greatest creation himself. But for the world's most profitable companies, it's actually the foundation on which they're built. But what is purpose? Well, purpose is your North Star. It's your why. It's the reason you get up every morning. It's the reason you stay up late at night working on your products and services. It's the hole in the universe that you are uniquely positioned to fill. It's the reason you gave up working 40 hours a week for somebody else so that you can work 80 hours a week for yourself. My favorite brand is Southwest. How many of you have flown Southwest, fans of Southwest in the room? Southwest is really interesting because they don't think of themselves in the airline business. They have almost 700 aircraft, but they're keen to share that they have a bigger purpose. Think of the bold colors of the aircraft. Think of that big heart on the under undercarriage of the plane. The casual uniforms of the staff, the amazing customer service, the fact that they're the only airline in the US right now that does not charge for checked baggage. These are not the decisions of a typical airline, I think you'd agree. See, Southwest's purpose is to connect people to what's important in their lives. They happen to do that through friendly, low-cost, reliable air travel. But it's their purpose that informs every decision they make. It's their purpose that made them decide not to charge for extra baggage. It's their purpose that empowers staff members to go the extra mile. Consider the time that gate attendants saw a family waving goodbye to their dad who was being deployed overseas. Rather than letting him um, go through security alone, Southwest agents enabled the family to come through security so they could spend an extra hour with their dad before he was deployed at the gate. When he boarded the plane, they waved him goodbye, and the plane didn't leave the gate because it was delayed for about half an hour, and so the Southwest attendants arranged for the family to board the plane for the remaining half hour before the plane took off. These are not the decisions of a company that's focused solely on the bottom line. These are the decisions of a company that's focused on its purpose. Its purpose happens to make it one of the most profitable airlines in the world. Profitable for 44 out of the last 45 years. When larger carriers have come and gone, the Uniteds, the US, the Continentals have all tried to do low-cost travel, but none of them have been able to compete because Southwest is in a different business. They're in a the business of love and connecting to what's important in your life. A Facebook post recently went viral from a Southwest passenger who boarded a flight in Dallas, and she was due to fly to Atlanta. And as the plane was taxiing down the runway, they got word at Dallas airport that her son had been in a traffic accident in Detroit. Rather than wait for her to get to Atlanta and tell her the good news or tell her the bad news, uh, they brought the plane back to the gate. They took the woman off the plane, brought her to a private room, sat her down, and told her that her son had been in a traffic accident, but he's okay. And she needn't worry because they booked her on a flight to Detroit, leaving in half an hour. Not only that, when she gets to Detroit, there'll be a car waiting to take her to the hospital to see her son. Oh, and they packed a lunch for her as well. The next day after she got to Detroit, got to Detroit, Southwest called to find out how her son was. These are stories that we all want told about our business, but these are stories that are inspired by a strategy that has been informed by purpose, a singular purpose. Last year, women sent five million tweets, negative tweets about body image. These were, this is not a statistic that has come from some campus-based women's organization, but from the world's largest soap company. And what's a soap company doing worrying about self-esteem and worrying about body image? Well, Dove, part of $130 billion Unilever brand, is one of Unilever's largest brands. Back in 2004, Dove conducted a study. They wanted to figure out around the world how many people, how many women, consider themselves to be beautiful, how many consider, how many consider themselves to be above average in appearance, how many had self-esteem issues. They were looking to get information that would help them to create campaigns to connect more authentically 
with their audience, but the results astounded them. What they discovered was that the minority of women in the world consider themselves above average, and only 2% of women recognize or consider themselves to be beautiful. When Dove saw these statistics, they realized that this was much greater than a marketing campaign. This was an opportunity and an obligation to change the company. And so Dove reorganized to ensure that they address the issues that women face in our world. And it's not about just marketing campaigns. Dove now trains thousands of teachers around the world to help students overcome self-esteem issues. In an age of body shaming and photoshopping, never has something been more important. And it's been very profitable for them. Dove has gone from a $200 million brand in the 1990s to a $4 billion brand today. But they don't lead with profit alone. They understand that when they meet the needs of their stakeholders, they will be rewarded with profit. Who's ready for lunch? <laughs> How many hot chicken takeover fans have we got here? Woo! Yeah. So most of us are familiar with the story, right? Joe DeLoss and his wife started a pop-up uh, kitchen in various places around the city a few years ago, raised a Kickstarter campaign, and today they occupy half the top floor of the North Market. Hot Chicken Takeover has been voted top restaurant in Columbus. It's got national media attention, and it's got almost 700 five-star reviews on Yelp. Oh, and they appeared on the Rachel Ray Show. There's no doubt that stories are being told about Hot Chicken Takeover every day, like this one. Do not let the long lines discourage you. It should actually encourage you to wait because it's confirmation that this is somewhere you want to eat. I love Hot Chicken Takeover for things other than the food. And she shares something from their website. It's about our people. Beyond an amazing community of customers, HCT provides supportive jobs to men and women who need a second chance at work. Be it homelessness, previous incarceration, or another barrier to employment, HCT employees are wildly ambitious and have set their sights on what's next. Once hired, we support their personal and professional goals with an array of benefits. I'll always support this place. Five stars. Keep doing what you're doing, Joe. And there are more. They go on and on. So you might try Hot Chicken Takeover or have discovered Hot Chicken Takeover because somebody told you there was good chicken, but you'll keep going back because you know the good work they do. And the stories you tell aren't all, are not always about the chicken. They're about what happens when you buy the chicken, the people you're supporting, the business that you're growing. So Hot Chicken Takeover, like Dove, like Southwest, they all have stories told about them every day, stories that we would love to have in our businesses. But we don't have to be the size of a Southwest or a Dove or even a hot chicken takeover to have these stories told about us. But what's interesting about these three businesses and all businesses that lead with purpose, that informs their strategy, that inspires their storytelling, is that that's exactly their formula. Everything in their business is deliberate. They didn't happen upon the stories. They didn't, these stories did not come out of thin air. These stories were inspired by very deliberate strategies, all informed by a clear and singular purpose. And what's great about becoming purpose-driven is that you don't have to give anything up. This is not about trading profitability for altruism. Purpose-driven brands are more profitable than their competitors. Back in 2001, the former chief marketing officer of Procter & Gamble, a guy called Jim Stengel, he wanted to investigate what were the common traits of the most successful brands in the world? And so he conducted a 10-year study of 50,000 global brands. And what he found was astounding. The top 50 financially performing brands across the 10 years all pursued purpose ahead of profit. And they were wildly profitable because of it. In fact, an investment in these 50 brands over the 10-year period would have yielded you a 400% greater return than the S&P 500 over the same time period. You don't have to give anything up to have a clear and singular purpose. But of course, it's not a radical idea, is it? This notion that if we take care or meet the needs of all our stakeholders, not just shareholders, that we'll actually be rewarded for it. That people will come work for us, people will buy from us, and our community will support us. It's not a radical idea. But it's easy to get lost in apps and news feeds and add-ons and features and benefits, whereas the most successful businesses are remarkably simple at their core. They solve the needs of all stakeholders, not just their shareholders. And that's where the stories come from. That's how we tell our stories. 
and the data supports it. 56% of overperforming companies who have a clearly stated purpose said that their organization's revenue growth was higher than their competitors. Employees who feel like they're working for something bigger than themselves are 30% more productive. Many employees would prefer to have purpose than a ping pong table. Employees of purpose-driven companies are more optimistic about their organization's ability to stay ahead in the future in comparison to other organizations. And 91% of global consumers would switch brands to one that aligns with their own values and purpose, assuming quality was the same or better. So look at Southwest, look at Chobani. These are companies that align with many of our values. We want to see people do well. We believe in love and raising the tide for all boats rather than just raising the tide for our shareholders alone. And when our values align with the values of the companies that we buy from, we remain loyal to them. We spend more money. Businesses that have no purpose other than growing fast face real internal challenges when growth falters for the first time. So if storytelling is informed by strategy and strategy is informed by purpose and customers and employees are now demanding purpose from the companies they work with and buy from, how do we find our purpose? Well, I'm glad you asked or the next slides wouldn't make any sense. <laughs> so we find our purpose at the intersection of three things. What we believe, what we do better than anybody else and what our stakeholders need. At the top, you'll notice our beliefs. So the, the greatest businesses are built on our beliefs. We don't check our hearts at the door. We don't believe one thing outside the company and act another way inside the company. The greatest companies are built coming straight from our own values, our own morals, and our own beliefs. And I'll email this to anybody in the room who wants it. So if you're, if you're, if you're taking notes, I can email you all the deck. So it's the intersection of our beliefs, our stakeholder needs in the bottom right-hand corner but not just our shareholders. And again, it's not a radical thought that we want to consider what our employees want. We want to consider what our customers want. But what if we measured all of our stakeholders' needs in addition to just the financial bottom line? Wouldn't that change how we make decisions in the company? Now, any company can find their purpose, be they a pre-revenue startup to a billion dollar a year organization. And the beautiful thing about addressing stakeholder needs is that we need to find out what our stakeholders need. So rather than trying to find people who fit into the thing we've built, we look for what they need and we build for their needs. Bottom left-hand corner, what do we do best? I ran a small company in Ireland in 2003. I have an accent, by the way. It's definitely me, not you, in case you... <laughs> so I had this small software company for bars and restaurants in Ireland. And a few months after launching, we weren't getting any traction. It wasn't growing very much. We had a few subscribers, but not a whole lot. And we took advice from various people. What should we do? What should we add on to the software? And people said, add on this, add on that. And so we did, but nothing grew, nothing changed. And eventually we had this amazing idea, just mind blowing idea. Why don't we ask all our subscribers what they want? And so we did. And it turns out they wanted the smallest little piece of our software. 10% of our software was what they were paying for. And we were worried about everything else. We didn't know what we did best. When we found out what we did best, we were able to get rid of focusing on the 90% of these other things and focus on the 10%, which is where the money was. It's often not, we often don't do, the, th the thing we think we do best is often not what we think it is. It might not be our product, it might not be our service, it could be an element of it, but we don't think about it. So establishing and discovering and articulating your purpose requires you to find these things out. You'll notice in the negative space, we create an arrow. Purpose in the middle is the intersection of these three. This arrow only appears when all three things are in place. And the beautiful thing about this is that we meet, when we discover our purpose and we build our business around our purpose, we meet the needs of our customers and on the highest level possible, not just their technical needs, not just their functional needs, but on an emotional level. They stay loyal to us, they tell stories about us, they post love, love notes on Yelp. They go to the scoop shop in the short north, when Jenny's ice cream shut down, they put love notes on the door. Why? because they believed in what Jenny believed in. And Jenny had done enough for the community that when she faltered and the company faltered, it was time for the community to rally around them. Purpose-driven brands have a lot of love and heart in the bank that they can draw from when things go wrong. So what happens when we discover our purpose? Well, when we discover our purpose, it then informs all of our strategies. So if we don't know where we're going or why we're getting there, how will we know who to hire? 
how we know what products to build, what services to offer. So purpose defines the strategy. The strategies don't define the purpose, and we can't incrementalize our way to success. Purpose helps establish our strategies with people, with positioning. Our storytelling comes out of this product process. And the beautiful thing about this is that this is not just about finding a way to tell our story, it's about a way to organize our whole company around a very clear vision, a very clear purpose. Our storytelling is inspired by the strategies that come out of this. But we don't have to be changing the world, we don't have to be uh, curing cancer to have a purpose. Your purpose might just be to take care of your family. It might be to have more time off, to travel, to spend time where you want to spend it. Whatever your purpose is, that's your purpose. But you'll be more successful when you organize your strategies around that. And these strategies will inspire the stories to be told about you authentically. But there are companies on our doorstep who are changing the world. And they inspire me every day. Companies like Crosschecks. Got any Crosschecks staff in the house? There we are. Crosschecks is a local company that you may have heard of. They've raised $35 million in funding in the last couple of years. Crosschecks secures and organizes healthcare records, healthcare data, but they do that, and they do that better than anybody else. But they have a grander mission and a grander purpose. They want to fundamentally change healthcare, but it doesn't just stop at healthcare. When I chatted with, with the founder, Sean Lane, last week, he told me that everything they do is so that life expectancy can be increased by 10 years. Now that's a story, and that's inspiring everything they do. And back to our earlier examples. What drove Chobani to make the decisions they did and earn the stories they told? A single cup of yogurt isn't going to change the world, but how they make it will. And what about Volkswagen? Well, they were founded with a singular purpose, to bring well-engineered, affordable vehicles to the masses. Then, in 2007, something changed. The Volkswagen leadership decided that they were going to change the purpose of Volkswagen from meeting the needs of all stakeholders to meeting the needs just of the shareholders. And from 2007, their new purpose became, officially, at leadership level, to become the world's largest automotive manufacturer by 2018. And nobody can argue that they got there. And they got there three years early, in fact. But in light of the scandal and the strategies that had to come out of that, that, that purpose, the decisions they had to make, nobody could argue that in losing their greater purpose, they lost far more than their way. So before I hand over to our amazing panel who are far smarter and know far more than me about storytelling, strategy, and purpose, let me leave you with this. Great stories move people. They move us to do amazing things. They inspire us. We no longer control the story. This is not about slapping a story onto a product when it comes time to marketing. Storytelling is no longer owned by the marketing department and it's no longer owned by the company. To have a great story, we have to inspire great stories. There are more companies founded every day that news journalists can, could not keep up with covering these stories. So if we want to slip above those, if we want to bubble up to the top, we're going to have to inspire our customers, our employees, our stakeholders so that we too can become a Chobani. Purpose determines strategy, and strategy inspires stories. So find your singular purpose, build the strategies that will help you fulfill this purpose. If you stay fanatically focused, the stories will tell themselves. If you'd like a copy of this presentation, our formula for how to develop purpose and strategy and storytelling, Send me an email and email you a whole bunch of tools to help you um, discover a purpose for your company. Thank you very much.